<laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's super loud. It's so annoying. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for making time for this interview. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so to start off um, the interview, firstly, I kind of wanted to explore your, your branding from the microphones to Mount Erie and then back to the microphones. Could you kind of explain both of these monikers a bit and maybe elaborate especially on the transitions from one to the other? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> uh, there isn't really a difference between the two things. It's just a name. Um, and there are just like different sort of like mileposts or something along the the route of all of the work that I've done in my life. Um, and that's this microphones album that I just released was my attempt to sort of say that in more detail to like talk about how the superficial name that the thing, the umbrella that it's under is uh, insignificant and it's all part of like the same compost heap. Yeah, um, so when did um, the thought of branding yourself to Mount Erie first occur to you and what kind of prompted that change? It's funny that you say branding, um, because that's such a commercial term. I sometimes use it uh, like uh, tongue in cheek, but it is true. Like it does apply. People who are doing bands are also doing brands. And but over the course of the like 20 years that I've been making music, I feel like there's been a shift in general culturally towards everyone is just branding themselves and people talk about their brand and like their socials and their yeah. um i at first i wasn't really sure what to call it either but i looked through an interview i think maybe like 2010 and i you did refer to it as a brand so that's kind of why i was inclined to call it that yeah i i know and i have called it that i think i put it like on my twitter bio definitely tongue-in-cheek like really sarcastically like this is all about my brand and i like how close it is to the word band um, because the truth is I don't think of it like that at all. And I actually am leaning as hard as I can away from that mentality of branding oneself. Yeah. Like, I, but anyway, that wasn't the question you asked. What was the question you asked again? When did, um, like that thought process first, like come to you that you wanted to change your name to Mount Erie and why, oh. why, what prompted yeah. it basically? Yeah. Well, so yeah, I started calling my tapes that I was making starting in like high school in 1995 or six, um, the microphones. And I, I did that because I was singing about microphones and recording and stuff. And over the years, I just stopped singing about those things. I sort of evolved, naturally evolved into singing about other ideas and bigger, more ambiguous things. Uh, and Mount Erie felt more potent to me as an idea also it's like an actual mountain near where i am yeah. from so i just wanted to yeah for for lots of reasons i felt like more appropriate to what i was actually singing about and doing so i changed it in 2003 also maybe i felt like i needed to sort of reset i just wanted to sort of have a a fresh start in a way artistically so if Mount Erie, like the actual mountain, if it wasn't there, like when you were making this music, do you think you would have stuck with the name, um, the microphones or maybe a different name? Oh, I don't know. But yeah, it's hard to say. The words Mount Erie are kind of confusing. Like they don't speak to everyone. They're not, <laughs> it's not a thing that, in, that most people, they're two sort of unrelated words, Mount and Erie. And it's like a place name, but it's not a huge mountain or a popular mountain. So it doesn't like evoke too much for most people, yeah. but to me personally, it really did. Yeah, um, it's hard to imagine what would have happened if, yeah, I do feel like I probably would have stopped calling it the microphones, 
because I just wasn't singing about recording stuff anymore and the name didn't feel relevant and I want to be relevant. And at the same time, I want to de-emphasize the name that things are called. I, I think it is mostly a distraction from the content. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, so um, on the microphone in 2020, you mentioned that your like earliest recordings went by different names other than the microphones and Mount Erie. Um, what were those names and what did they mean to you at the time? <laughs> well, I was a teenager. So the first, I was in bands. I played the drums and sometimes guitar and singing, but mostly I, was, I started off being the drummer in the bands. And, um, but my first like thing that was just me, my first recording project was called Mostly Clouds and Trees, which is a big awkward name. Uh, and it, I called it that because that's what I took pictures of. I was, I was really into taking pictures and I were, my first job was in this dark room. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I just was taking like hundreds of pictures of mostly clouds and trees. So that's what I called my tape. Uh, and then the second tape was called X-Ray Means Woman, which was a graffiti that I saw on like the side of a road in oh, Northern California. Yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and that tape is really weird. It's pretty much unlistenable. It's like, uh, I got this drum machine for Christmas one year and I decided I'm going to make a whole album that's only using this drum machine. <laughs> so it's bad. It's not good. I think there might be a little bit of experimental electric guitar yeah. on there, but yeah, that's, that's X-Ray Means Woman. And then, so the third tape after that was the microphones. Um, okay. So now kind of getting more into the, the songwriting process, I've heard that you often um, record songs as you compose them. Is, is this true or, or what is like the songwriting process look like for you? Yeah, that's true. I, and that's kind of why it was first called the microphones actually, because I was just, all I wanted to do was be recording and discovering multi-track recording and what was possible with overdubbing and playing all the different instruments and layering different atmospheric sounds. It was so exciting to me. So they weren't songs really. Um, so yeah, you, you could say that songwriting happened while I was recording because I, I don't even know if you'd call it songwriting, like composition happened as, yeah. as, as I was recording and exploring the idea it just sort of naturally evolved. And it's still kind of like that, even though nowadays lately I've been writing more like orthodox songs, I would say with words and narrative and story, I still am sort of letting it evolve as I record. And I always record myself so I'm not like stressing out about trying to be super efficient with my studio time. Yeah, it's makes pretty sense. important to me to give myself limitless time to explore while I'm recording. Yeah, so um, kind of seeing how you, you play a, a wide array of instruments, the first instrument that you picked up were, were the drums, right? Or was it the tuba? Tuba, but tuba. that doesn't really count. I, I mean, yeah, I started playing tuba in the school band in sixth grade, uh, sixth to ninth grade, but I don't really include that because it didn't feel like creation. You know, it felt like learning the fingerings and learning to read the notes on the paper, but it felt like going through the motions. And yeah. it was once I started playing the drums with friends in bands that felt like, oh, okay, we are making this thing. Yeah, I totally it, understand. It was like in its own category. Um, which instrument is your is your favorite to play? Is it the drums or a different instrument? I don't really have a favorite. Fair, that's fair. Um, do you think your music would have been different if you started, let's say, playing guitar first rather than the drums? It, hmm, maybe. I feel like I can't think of any examples of this, but I feel like I've heard of lots of songwriters that you don't think of as drummers. I've heard of a lot of people starting on the drums. I think that drums, starting on drums helps a lot with uh, having a sense of like the architecture of a song and like the, Definitely. yeah, the, the spine of it. Yeah, 
like kind of the the skeleton of the song. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I get, moving on. Um. What do you think about um the Glow Part Two kind of being your most recognized and popular album? Do you agree with this sentiment, or did it ever come as a surprise to you? I, yeah, it is my most re- popular album. That's true. I mean, just based on like the numbers or <laughs> yeah. how, ma- how many people tell me that, but, uh, and it's, it's all surprised to me, honestly, like everything is, a, <laughs> the fact that I'm able to do this and that anyone is interested at all is still a surprise to me. So yeah, that's, it's a surprise. I, I don't know if I agree with it or not. I mean, it's, it changes from day to day, my perception of my own self and the stuff I make, yeah. but I, it's not frequent that the Glow Part 2 is my favorite one. Usually I'm most interested in what I'm currently working on, but that's natural, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, So the cover art for the Glow Part 2, it originated from a, a Dutch cookbook, correct? Or... Yeah, that's true. And why did you end up choosing this for the cover art? Well, that's a... That's an interesting question. I don't know why I chose. I think that, so it was in high school when I worked in the dark room, it was at a place called The Business that is, uh, it still exists. And it was like a dark room and a bookstore and a record store and a cafe. It was like a all, all things, tiny little small town place. Now it's mostly a record store, but uh, it, it was at the time I worked at, there and there was this old uh cookbook that the cover had been torn off i think i found it like slid under one of the bookshelves as i was like filing away used books and back in the like foreign language cookbook section (laughs) and i was like oh that's a cool picture and i taped it to the wall in the dark room where i worked where i had all my other cool pictures taped up um And it just was with me for a couple of years. And then I moved to Olympia and I probably taped it to the wall in my house. And then I think I gave it to my friend Mira and she had it at her house for a while. I just was just like a piece of paper that was with me through many moves. So it's been places. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I had never like focused on it, but then after making a few albums and all this touring and I was making this album called the glow part two, I just saw it at Mira's house and, or maybe she had already given it back to me at that point. I forget, but just was like, that's a cool picture. I'm going to just use it. I had not used other artists for my record yeah. covers. I had just drawn things myself. Yeah. Well, no, that's not true. My friend Kayla made, uh, it was hot. We stayed in the water. Anyway, yeah. um, I, it just was a piece of paper that was in my life waiting for the right moment. Uh, This might be kind of random, but I noticed that your like profile picture or profile icon on on YouTube and on Gmail features the artwork um, from Song Islands. Um, Is this like a deliberate choice? Is that, did you choose it for a specific reason or just cause? That floating head that's in. Yeah, that floating head. Yeah, that. I really like it. My friend Kyle, that's another example of artwork that my friend painted. So I was wrong when I said I don't use other people, other artists. But anyway, yeah, Kyle Field painted that. And I just have always loved it. And it has always felt like this mysterious kind of, I don't know, mascot or logo of this project, of this, not Mount Erie necessarily, but maybe like the whole, uh, record label or publishing enterprise, whatever it is I'm doing. Like that is, I think of that face as um, like the mystery that I'm pursuing. Cause it is mysterious. It's like, what is going on there? Is it a yeah, cloud? Sure. Is it like yeah. a deformed head? When I first saw it, I thought it was a cloud. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I don't know what it is. That's why I still like it. Yeah. It's definitely cool that it has that mysterious aspect. I guess as a, as a follow-up question, what would be your favorite album cover from your own work? And then maybe like favorite, like all time from any artist album cover. 
Unfortunately, I'm basically incapable of answering favorite questions. Favorite, okay. I just can't Fair. do it. There's some that you really like from other artists, maybe not a favorite, but just a couple. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's also a hard one to, I don't know why I'm so bad at this. I have so many beloved album covers that it's hard to summon. Sorry, it's not a very yeah, yeah. interview subject. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess, um, um, do, you, do you believe that your music is kind of interconnected even like beyond the titles of the microphones in Mount Erie and how, oh, I guess it is, right? Because earlier you mentioned how they're just names. So everything yeah, kind of interconnected. But Yes, definitely. Yeah. I, how, I, how would you describe um, albums being interconnected? Well, I mean, they just are interconnected because they're, they're all part of this uh, output of my life. There's, there aren't boundaries in my life, really. Um, uh, yeah, they're all just, I'm mumbling, I'm rambling about it, but I think that that's the true state of existence is that everything flows into the next thing. And these albums aren't isolated from each other. They're not islands, they're connected. And so I've actually gone to, uh, I've, I've gone to some effort to make that more apparent by, for example, having the same like background foghorn go through a whole album and even like begin the next album. Like as I, I try to bridge things, I try and yeah, start I, one album where the last one ends off. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that, that foghorn, that like very reoccurring um note in the glow part two, that was, um that came, you were inspired from Twin Peaks, right? Or can yeah, you kind, kind of, of elaborate on that? I, I have a memory of watching Twin Peaks and noticing that the, um, the background, like atmospheric sound, whenever there were scenes at um, Pete and Catherine and Josie's house out by the water, because it was like a waterfront house, there was always this sort of distant like and like maybe a ding, 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 like a <laughs> maritime sound just to like yeah. put, put you in this, the place of it. But it was so subtle and I noticed how effective that was to place something in a specific atmosphere. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, album should do that. It's almost as if I had recorded the album, not on blank tape, but tape that had a, a tone to it yeah. or like pa painting on a colored paper or something. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So in an interview, I think the same interview that I mentioned earlier, the one from 2010, you kind of mentioned how some albums are more deliberate, whereas other albums are kind of like side projects that aren't like maybe as significant. Which do you think are the most deliberate albums in your discography? Most of them. I mean, yeah, the, the releases that I have put out that are more like a singles compilation or like a collection of rarities or I'm a, for, speaking of that foghorn thing, I'm about to release a, probably a vinyl only thing called foghorn tape. And it's only that foghorn sound for like 30 minutes. And so that's going to be not a deliberate one. That's going to be sort of a extra. Yeah. That one. still seems really cool. Though, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I had just have too many to list them, but uh, yeah, 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 if we were to go down the list, I would be able to tell you. So, yeah, throughout a lot of, um, I guess, your career in music, you've used analog recording practices extensively. Um, how has this changed over the years? And what are your thoughts currently on like analog versus digital practices? I've never been too hung up on like the ideology of one or the other. I've always prioritized just using whatever was available to me. And it just happened that well, I started recording in a time before digital recording was available or very widespread, and that's how I learned. So that's what I stuck to. And then I hung on to that for a while, even though it became more and more challenging. It was when I became like a single parent 
with very little time that I started recording on a computer. So starting with A Crow Looked At Me, I recorded those in the most simple way possible just because I needed to get the idea down. And I wasn't interested in production or... Yeah, they were very yeah. skele skeletal recordings. Yes, exactly. And I, I was focused on... I almost felt like production for those songs would have been a little bit like uh, obscene or something. Um, you know, like making it sound epic. Um, and then I really liked the simplicity of that, of not having to fuss with dilapidated, obsolete recording equipment. But lately, I've sort of gotten disillusioned with the computer. And even though it's much more inconvenient, I'm uh, going back to tape. But yeah, the answer is that I don't care that much. I mean, it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. I think the focus should be on how it actually feels and sounds to listen to it. I think you mentioned once how you, I think you, is it correct that you prefer like distortion in like analog format over digital format? Well, digital distortion. I mean, when you're like, when your level is too high for a digital audio, it doesn't, it just like gets glitchy and pixelated it doesn't sound like yeah, distortion like it sounds clips, like it sounds of, yeah it sounds yeah. like cl clipping that's um not that beautiful but yeah. analog beautiful analog distortion is like the most beautiful yeah thing to me yeah okay since we were um on the topic of um a crow looked at me in this album you kind of express like two times or however many times that you don't want to learn anything from Genevieve's death and how sometimes there's simply nothing to learn in the first place. Has this remained true over the years or do you think you have learned something from it? And if so, what? Yeah, of course I've learned from it. I mean, or and continue to. And it wasn't actually... A tr like a true earnest statement that I don't want to learn anything from this. That was more a statement of just like, um, uh, like r resentful towards the universe or something that there was going to be some kind of lesson. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, I can't really summarize what I've learned from it. It's, yeah, yeah, for sure. it's an ongoing thing for the rest of my life, probably. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I understand that you're putting more of her work in art books. How has that been going so far? It's going great. Yeah, it's a huge project and I'm, I work on it every day. In fact, all the other windows on my computer that are open right behind your face are like Photoshop pages that I'm working on. So cool. That's, that's great. I can't wait to be able to see that. Um, besides kind of um, visual art, is there any other projects besides, I guess, the, the Foghorn one that you mentioned that you are working on or will be working on soon? Yeah, I'm also about to announce um, a book, a photo book of microphones in 2020. It's a 760 page photo book version of the album. Will, that... it, will it include the, the photos in the, in the film? Yeah, exactly. It's just that it's all of the photos, like one per page, okay. and then all the lyrics. So that yeah. will come out soon. All right. Well, yeah. This is perfect because it leads on to my next question. When I was watching the film for the first time, I kind of noticed how throughout these photographs, there's kind of like these translucent like images of you throughout the pictures. Can mm -hmm. you kind of elaborate what that represents? Mm -hmm. Not sure what it represents, but I, yeah, I have a lot of those. I haven't counted them, maybe like a hundred, like ghost photos. It's because I had this old camera. I mean, it's, it's still my camera. That's still the camera I use uh, for, for like film photography, where I had this setting where the shutter just opens and then you have to press the shutter again to get it to close. So like very long exposures for a low light or you know, night sky. And I, I usually was traveling by myself and like living by myself. And so 
the only way I could take my own picture was to set the camera on something, open the shutter, run out and stand there for a minute and then run, run back to close the shutter. So it was like a picture of a place with me superimposed sort of tra uh, translucently. I just really liked how they yeah, turned out. I, I kept doing them. That's really neat. I, I completely thought it was like something done digitally or like through Photoshop, but yeah. No way. Really cool. Um, so I guess getting back to music, um, so there's a lot of reoccurring lines throughout your your discography, and one of them being, um, I took my shirt off in the yard, right? Um, so when did this like line kind of first pop into your head, and mm -hmm. and has this meaning like changed? The meaning of it has it changed for you? Yeah, I I don't know when it first popped into my. I mean, it was in it's on that song, glow the glow part two. That's yeah. the song. Um, <laughs> 2001 probably wrote that song yeah i wasn't even born yet <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah i don't know it's just uh writing songs writing poems phrases and images just occur and they work and they might not be literally true although i did take my shirt off in the yard <laughs> i mean <laughs> that actually happened I, I think it was like pruning something or I don't know it was a hot day but uh yeah uh, it's hard to ask what poems mean I a phrase I heard the poet Robert Frost say it, there was a quote an exchange it's like an interview asked him to explain a poem and his answer was you want me to say it worse basically like the poem says it the line says it, it speaks for itself. Yeah. To try and explain it would be to say it in a worse way. Yeah, yeah, it should be left up to interpretation, I suppose, yeah. Um, I guess kind of straying away from that then, um, kind of heading more into like the music industry kind of aspect. Um, what are your, your thoughts on sampling in just music in general? Do you think it undermines one's creativity and like originality? Like if somebody were to sample one of my songs and use it in a new new creation of their own? Yeah, or just if anybody were to sample like anything basically. Uh yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I think it's cool. I think the one thing that is annoying is when people don't like attribute their their sources. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Which and maybe it's fine now, but there was a period there I feel like maybe ten years ago or so. I associate it more with Tumblr for some reason, but um, when people had a mentality that like everything was free and you didn't need to attribute your sources, like it, it was a little bit too loose and I don't know, I just feel like it's important to pay homage to, to who made the thing. But yeah, I, I'm into the idea of everything sort of being fair game to play with. Yeah. Um, so following with that topic, I wanted to touch upon your kind of your relationship with modern like teenage music, like hip hop and rap. And mm -hmm. as I'm sure you recall, um, Lil Peep sampled some of your like two of your songs. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you feel about these samples and how did kind of did this feeling change after Lil Peep's death? Because I, I think you tweeted about it, right? About you tweeted um Lil Peep being on your mind, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't like it. The, fir the first time I saw the video for uh, one of those songs, Beamer Boy, Beam yeah, Beamer, Beamer Boy, maybe. And White Wine was the other one, I believe. Yeah. I can't remember which one it was that I saw first, but I was like, what is this? And what's it about? And like, what's it saying? And I just didn't think yeah and it didn't make me feel good about like the future of <laughs> humanity i mean that sounds shitty or am i maybe i shouldn't swear but no it's also good yeah uh i i became less dismissive i guess uh, over the years i just felt like it's not for me uh I'm, <laughs> it made me realize like this is 
there are like new layers of, of culture that are coming up that aren't, that I'm not part of. And I wasn't bugged by being sampled. That's fine. It was, I would have felt this way if it was unrelated to me. It was more just like, I'm not into a glorification of drugs or checking out or like disengagement or I don't know, like surrender basically. I think I, I want the young people of the future to feel like life is for living and to not like pursue numbness. I felt that way even when I was a teenager though. Yeah. So I guess, um, what were some of your, your like biggest influences when you were a teenager? I think you, you mentioned some of them like Sonic Youth and the 2020 album, but what kind yeah. of other influences were there? That, that whole world, like basically like the alternative rock boom of the mid 1990s, the grunge or whatever. And, and then the more experimental or weird stuff and like beat happening and, punk or you know underground music that it's not gr like grunge is kind of a fake term but yeah you know what i mean like yeah. guitar based music that was experimental and feedbacky and yeah. home recorded and sloppy and <laughs> the good um, stuff yeah anti corporate um so i guess talking about sound how would you describe your sound like what category or would you would you put it in to someone unfamiliar with your with your work yeah sometimes when uh somebody's aunt or like a guy who's selling me tires asks me what kind of music i'm playing i play i I, I just don't know how to answer it i never know the answer i say that i play songs play music Sometimes it depends on who I'm answering it to, but yeah. mostly the truth is like I, experimental. I don't know. I, I never want to stop experimenting mm -hmm. and exploring and I don't want to be confined by any idea. Yeah, that's a very pure response. Yeah. Um, let's see. So are, what are, I guess, some artists that you're currently listening to and have you been have you ever tried to like broaden your horizons in terms of what music genres you like? Yeah, all the time. I, although I don't have like a good routine of exploring or like, I don't know, following music blogs or I don't, I don't know how to discover new stuff. Actually, no, band, band camp has been good lately. I sometimes go there and just sort of discover things and that's cool. Um, I've been listening to a lot of this Estonian singer named Marie Kalkun. And I've been listening to a lot of this kind of um, old ancient Japanese imperial court music called Gagaku, which is- It's interesting. Yeah, it sounds weird and like specialized and esoteric. And I guess it is, but yeah, I love it. Um, I have this five-year-old daughter and so we, and she's really into music. And so we take turns a lot. She chooses Disney stuff a lot, but also she'll choose uh, Dolly Parton or <laughs> yeah. um, uh, all kinds. Of, yeah. Yeah. So what I listen to this like esoteric historical atmospheric music, but then also I'm listening to songs that a five-year-old can wrap their mind around or, or like, you know, the Beatles or yeah. Uh, um, Joni Mitchell or Bob Dylan or the classics because I'm giving this kid a musical education. I know she's still um, very young, but based off of like now, what instruments do you think she would be taking up in the future? She's the singer. She's the lead singer in whatever band <laughs> she talks about. She's already talking about like who in her class is going to play what instruments in her band. She, just a little bit ago, she was talking about, she's like, okay, well, this doll of mine is a princess, but this one is a street punk. And I was like, what's a street punk? And she's, I, I had never heard her use that phrase before. So yeah, she has some conception of uh, punk and how bands are formed. She always wants to know who plays what in every record we listen to. She wants to know every member of the band's name. 
Yeah, that's that's really cool. I can't wait to see um what she makes in the future. I'm sure she'll make great things. Um yeah, we'll see. So could you kind of I don't know if this have you if you've ever talked about this before, but could you kind of um explain um the cover art to microphones in 2020? Like like the picture itself and like the bordering, like I see how there's some pages near the picture. What are like those pages of? Oh, uh, well, I guess when I design record covers, I often forget that most people won't see it uh, in, well, they won't hold it in their hands. Most people will see it on a computer screen in a very small version, but I design things to be printed, like it's an LP jacket. And so yeah. it's a gatefold record and it's it's actually like, double just two squares wide um and it's all the lyrics of the album are printed on the cover and i thought they're printed really small because there's a lot of words but uh that's what the what looks like pages is is it's just all the lyrics um and then i don't know what else to explain it's just that picture is me in like 2001 or something in a reflected in a puddle yeah. in Mexico. When I first saw it, I, did, I had no idea it was upside down until someone pointed it out to me. I was like, whoa, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of disorienting. I thought it was, had that picture for a long time. I think I've used it for things before. It's in a, one of the books I put out, but it just seemed particularly well suited for this like self reflective uh, historical, like backwards looking microphones album. Mm -hmm. um so i guess staying on the topic of the microphones in 2020 and one of the lines on the album is um it's not that bad but i know i wanted to go deeper beneath the pain mm -hmm. beneath the human um so do you think you accomplished this depth in the way that your younger self imagined it it's a constant effort um I don't know if, I, yes, I think I, to varying degrees, I have accomplished it. I mean, that's the pursuit. I think that it's basically, that's my definition of what art is, is to go deeper, to go yeah, definitely to like pr penetrate deeper than the human experience. And throughout your discography, you kind of mentioned the moon a lot too. What does the moon exactly like represent to you and how, if it's changed, like this representation, how has it changed throughout the years? Uh, the moon is a pretty common and po potent uh, poetic symbol throughout history. Um, I like what it, how it gets used in Zen poetry a lot as a symbol for like true, like Buddha nature. This is getting too specific about Buddhism maybe, but um, yeah, I, it doesn't mean the moon. The moon, for me, when I use it as a symbol, I think it it's just, I love how universal it is. We all like live under the same night sky with this like weird bright circle yeah. <laughs> above us. But it's it's like universal and common and boring, yet so alien. It's so other and just unknown. It's like, it's visual evidence that like the infinity of outer space is literally just right there. Yeah. And it's, it's like a shortcut to like a profound realization that mostly we go through life, not realizing mostly we're just like, Oh yeah. Moon. <laughs> not, not actually um, taking it in. acknowledging the depth of what that means. Yeah. So I guess moving on kind of, um, in the in the song, I I felt my size. You you kind of compare your existence and being to objects that are much larger to you. How we were like just talking about right now, and this song is referenced in the the 2020 album. So do you think um this like sense of your size in the universe has changed? Mm, no, I think I felt like the same amount of tiny. <laughs> for the last 20 years or so yeah i i can relate to that. 
Let's see. What are there any maybe misconceptions that you hear a lot about your work that you're aware of that you would like to clear up, possibly? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there are tons. It's. I feel like I'm mostly in, in an ocean of misconceptions. <laughs> and there was a time, maybe like a full ten years of my life, where I felt like really frustrated and hung up on the that recognition of that misunderstanding really hurt it it's it's not comfortable to know that you're misunderstood and yeah. so i would like go to great lengths to try and correct that and just be like no that's not what i meant by that and here let me try and explain it again in a different way but i've sort of given up on trying to correct it and i'm I've accepted the inevitability of misunderstanding. But yeah, one big one is I, I notice um, people think I'm just sad. People think my music equals sadness or sorrow or and that, that's what I'm pursuing. And it's just not true at all. Yeah, even a crow looked at me, even though it's talking about like humongous and kind of devastating facts, the what that album is about and also now only, they're about the beauty and the love that shines through all of those experiences. And um, I know that lots of people out there got that from it. So that's good. But it's frustrating to, to have it simplified to the point where like, I just am a symbol of sorrow for people yeah. who maybe can't think more deeply about it. Yeah, I can see how that how that can hurt over time. Um, so I guess moving on to like the last kind of thing I wanted to touch upon in this interview was kind of um, just the the music industry in general. So it's kind of safe to assume that you don't like Spotify based off of like your your tweets and seeing how, you know, the microphones in 2020 isn't on Spotify. Can you shed some light on like Spotify and Bandcamp as streaming services and which you prefer as a musician? Well, yeah, I, everyone should know. And everyone should tell their friends that um, Bandcamp is more supportive to artists than, yeah. than Spotify is, even though it might be like one inch less convenient for them. Um, but it just comes down to the fact that I, I feel I deserve to be compensated yeah, for my work. Mm -hmm. And Spotify doesn't pay artists yeah. fairly at all. And it's just like a really exploitative and destructive business model. Mm -hmm. So that's all like it, for people who care about the survival of music and art, <laughs> they should stop using Spotify and not just Spotify, but like these exploitative streaming services. And the uncomfortable thing is it, it just is going to have to cost more money. Like you have to pay mm -hmm. money. Things can, yeah, and we've been living in this kind of illusion that where things are free for, I don't know, 10 years now or however long, and people have grown accustomed to this reality where things are free and always available. So it's maybe going to be hard or impossible to go backwards from that, but that's that's what has to happen. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> noted, I guess. Um I guess as like my final question, closing remarks, um, what motivated you, what, what motivated you to start your own record label? That was in 2004. And I, I always, I started out, out uh, doing my own record label when I was a teenager, I put out my own tapes and I always really loved doing all of that, doing the production and distribution and artwork and printing and everything. I love it. When I worked with K Records for those five microphones albums, uh, I I still was doing most of it myself. And so I just recognized that if I wanted to have a sustainable life in this music world, I, I was going to need to do most of it myself to to retain control and to get paid. Yeah, so kind of in the the modern music world, do you would you recommend artists that are maybe just starting that they do the same? 
I wish I was better at answering questions about like advice for the modern music world, but I don't know. It's a whole different universe now. It's such a dire time. And yeah, for sure. I don't know what guidance I could give to somebody who's just starting out. Yeah. I mean, Other than like in a business sense, I, th I could give like artistic advice maybe, but not about how to make money because of the stuff we were just saying. People want everything to be free. So it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, well, those are kind of all, all the questions I had. And I, I just, yeah, I really appreciate you being here and giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you. My it's pleasure. Really great. Yeah. So yeah, in the interest of your time, I guess we'll, we'll, I'll stop the recording here. Okay.